Okay, so welcome to the uh, welcome to the first tutorial. What we're going to do today is just do um, four different problems illustrating the basic concepts for how to calculate normal stresses and uh, shear stresses in objects. So I've already put the first problem uh, up on the board. So what we have here is a concrete column uh, square cross section 10 inches by 10 inches and we're given the density of concrete in the problem 0 .0, 0.09 pounds per cubic inch and um, the column has a couple of different loads acting on it it's got an 80 kip load now one kip one kilopound is a thousand pounds so this is 80,000 pounds here and then we've got on this collar we've got two 50 kip loads sitting on that. So three external loads here in total. And the problem asks for a couple of things. First of all, uh, we wanna know what the stress is at point A in the column. And then in part two, we're asked what the maximum stress is in the entire column. So let's go ahead and, uh, and get started here and do the first part. So we're always, you always calculate stress within an object at a particular point. And here we want the stress at point A. Stress is average internal force at a point. So if we want the stress at point A, we need the internal force at point A as a starting point. How do we get internal force? We take a section cut through our object at the location of interest. So we're gonna take a section cut and break this object apart uh, through the plane of point A. And then in order to figure out what the internal forces are, we analyze the free body diagram of one portion or the other portion of the object. Doesn't matter which portion you do, you get the same internal force. Um, always nice to do the one that uh, has fewer forces on it or the one that's easier. So we'll do the top half in this case. So sketching what the free body diagram looks like for that upper portion of the column there. Uh, now remember when you draw a free body diagram, there are three types of forces that you need to include. Uh, you need to include your externally applied loads. So that's our 80 kip load in this case. Uh, we need to include uh, body forces. So that is um, the weight of the object itself. So the center of mass of that little portion of the concrete column is gonna be right in the center. Okay, here we go. We'll just call that W subscript A. And then our internal um, forces as well. Uh, support reactions, um, no support reactions here, but the internal forces are like, like support reactions for this little uh, piece. So when you cut through something solid, right, you can have uh, three different sort of types of internal forces. We can have an internal force that is oriented perpendicular to our section cut, and that's called an internal normal force. Uh, we would write this as N subscript A for the internal normal force that is existing in the plane of point A here. Then we can have a horizontal uh, force and that's a shear force because it's parallel to our section cut VA. And um, then we can have an internal moment M subscript A as well. Now we're not going to deal with stresses caused by internal moments until a little bit later in the course until we get uh, to lecture six I think it is. Uh, so we're just focusing on stresses caused by internal normal forces and internal shear forces uh, at the moment. Okay so easy to see in this picture that if we do uh, a sum of the forces in the x direction that was going to be. So sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero. 
that VA here equals zero, okay? So we don't have to worry about that. So that tells us uh, here that therefore uh, shear stress we know is internal shear force divided by cross-sectional area. Shear stress at point A is going to be the internal shear force at A. So tau subscript A is V subscript A divided by the cross-section at point A. Here, right? V A is zero, so we've got zero shear stress at A. Okay, let's do uh, the normal force now, and we get that by looking at the sum of the forces in the y direction. We'll set that equal to zero. Here we go. And what have we got? We've got the normal force, uh, Na is upwards. And then acting downwards, we've got our 80 kip loads. So 80 times 10 to the three here, putting that into units of pounds here. And then we've got WA here, which is the weight of just this little uh, portion that we've sectioned off. So that's gonna be equal to the density of the concrete. Uh, pounds, it doesn't matter uh, in terms of whether you're talking about pound mass or pound force because it's a one-to-one -one conversion between pound mass and pound force. So we wanna take the uh, density or specific weight um, and multiply that by the volume of this little 10-foot section. So we've got uh, our density 0 0.0 nine, that's in pounds, this is in pounds now, and A is gonna come out in pounds, multiplied by cross-sectional area, that's 10 inches by 10 inches, multiplied by length, 10 feet, and convert that to inches by multiplying by 12, and that all has to sum up to zero there. So that gives us a value for Na. And when I did that, I got 81.1 kip. Okay, uh, so now that we've got that, now we can calculate the normal stress at A. So the normal stress at point A is gonna be the normal force at point A divided by the cross-sectional area at point A. We've got 81.1 times 10 to the three. This, by the way, uh, out of this equation comes out in pounds and then I've divided back through by a thousand to change it into uh, kip there. Now I'm changing it into pounds again, divided by the cross-sectional area, 10 inches by 10 inches. Okay, there we go. All right, so from that we get 800 and uh, 10 or 811, there we go, PSI. And box there, normal stress at A, shear stress at A is zero. So PSI, pounds per square inch, pounds per square inch. So whenever you do calculations uh, using U.S. units, um, stress calculations using U.S. units, use pounds, inches, PSI. Okay, pounds, inches, PSI. Pounds, inches, PSI. And then whenever you're doing stress calculations in SI units, you want to be using newtons, meters, pascals. And as we'll see, uh, stresses are often in KSI, which is uh, units of uh, thousands of PSI, and stresses are often in uh, megapascals, 10 to the 6 pascals. Okay, so we're done part one there. Now we want to uh, look at what the maximum stress in the column is. Okay, so the column here, aside from this collar on it, all has a constant cross-sectional area. So 
thinking about um, that and the fact that wherever we cut the column, the shear force is going to be zero and we're just going to have a normal force. What we want to look for is the place where our internal normal force is going to be maximum because when internal normal force is maximum, constant cross-sectional area along its length, wherever we have the greatest internal normal force will have the greatest normal stress. Um, as we cut lower and lower down in the column, so if we were to move this section cut down to that point there, then the length of column we have grows and the weight of that little section would grow as well. So that would increase the normal force. So just by considering that, we can see that the uh, maximum normal force in the column is going to occur down at the base. Okay, so B. So that's where we want to look for um, the internal normal force. And that internal normal force that's there, because that's right at the base, that's the same as the support reaction. Um, no difference between taking away the support and shaving off a tiny little bit of material to get within the actual column. So support reaction and the internal forces there are really the same thing. Okay. So uh, max stress will occur when normal stu normal force in column is maximum that's at the base point B okay all right, so uh, in order to get what that is, we'll just change this into a free body diagram here. There we go. Um, and we're going to have our normal force at point B like that. So some of the forces in the Y direction has to be equal to zero. All right, um, we've got what? NB has to be equal to 50 plus 50 plus 80 plus the weight of this entire column acting downwards. So now we got rid of that section cut there. That was our point A. And here's the approximate center of the whole column there. And this is just W for the weight of the entire column. So let's put all those things in. So you've got NB subtract W, which is going to be 0 0.09 multiplied by the cross-sectional area, that being the density or specific weight again, uh, multiplied by the length, which is 40, multiplied by 12 to convert feet to inches, subtract we've got two of those 50 kip loads so 50 times 10 to the 3 subtract the 80 kip load from up there and set that equal to zero so out of that we get the normal force at the base of the column which came out to 184.3 kip. Again, coming out in pounds from this, so times 10 to the 3, 184,000, uh, divide by 1,000 to put it into a number that's um, in more appropriate units. Uh, now we want to take this and say that the normal stress at point B is the normal force at point B divided by the cross-sectional area at point B, 184.3 times 10 to the 3, put that into pounds, 
and then divided by the cross-sectional area there. So now we've got a uh, hundred and no one point eight KSI. So this is going to come out to uh, one thousand eight hundred and forty-three psi, and then we're dividing that by a thousand, putting it into units of KSI here. Okay, so there we go. Uh, first problem uh, complete. Okay, let's do a little bit of erasing here and then we'll put up the second problem. All right, perfect. So let's see what we have for this problem. Leave myself some space there. So this is um, a metal hanger here, pinned over on the left. And we've got here a rope, a cable, and uh, some sort of weight W hanging from it. There we go, very nice. This in here is 30 degrees and from this pin to where the mass is hanging, we've got 3.5 meters. And um, then we've got a top view of these two pins uh, here. Um, and we've got some labels too. Let's put those labels on. That's uh, point A there. Down here we have point B. This guy over here is point C. Um, so top view of pins A and B are like this. So for A, that's pretty sloppy. There we go. We've got a single bracket like that, and then member AC like this, and we'll just draw a broken line to indicate that that continues. And then the pin goes through like that. So that's what we describe as a single shear uh, pin configuration because the shear stress in the pin is concentrated over this single plane where there's the interface between the member and the bracket. Uh, for pin B here, we've got a double shear configuration where there's two portions of the bracket here attached to the wall and the member going out like this and then the pin runs through like so. So here this is called double shear configuration uh, because the shear that the pin is experiencing is spread over two cross-sectional areas. 
Okay, the other information that we have in this is we're showing what the cross-sectional dimensions of bars AC and BC look like, and they're both the same. So the cross-section of a B, nope, that's a C and B C look as follows. Okay, they've got a rectangular cross section, 25 millimeters in height, and width 10 millimeters there. Okay, uh, what do we want to do in this? Okay, I'll read the problem statement. A hanger assembly is constructed using two steel bars and three steel pins. So one bar, two bar, one, two, three pins. Okay. Um, the maximum allowable normal and shear stress in the steel is uh, 280 megapascals and 145 megapascals, respectively. So we've got the maximum normal stress in the steel can be 280 megapascals and the maximum shear stress that's allowed is 145 megapascals. All right, now we've got the problem statements. First, considering only bars AC and BC, what is the maximum allowable weight W that can be supported by the hangers. Okay, what is the maximum allowable weight that can be supported by the hangers? So 0.1 for A, C, and B, C, max allowable value of W is the question. Okay, we'll put this down for a second. Okay, so we've got allowable stresses here, or maximum stresses that we can have in the steel. And we need to find the maximum value of W. So obviously as W increases, the internal forces within these two bars is gonna increase, which is going to drive the stress um, upwards. So if we could figure out what the internal forces are in terms of W, then we could write equations for the stresses in those two bars in terms of W, and we'd be able to solve them by using these maximum stress values. Okay. Now this is one of these problems where you can't uh, directly take a section cut like we did in the previous problem when we wanted the stress at A. When we wanted the stress in A in that column, we could just uh, straight away section cut through A and then figure out what the internal forces were um, and then calculate our stresses. If you do something similar here, like take a section cut uh, that way to figure out, to try and get a look at what those internal forces are, then you get left with uh, something that's really messy in terms of uh, trying to solve it, right? We'd have something for a free body diagram that looks uh, like this, where we could have um, a normal force here and a shear force here and then Another normal force here, let's just label this one and one. Uh, this would be something different, another shear force uh, there. Our internal uh, moments as well, right? And there's just too many unknowns to try and write um, an expression for N, let's say just in terms of W, okay? So let's scrap that idea and then uh, back up a little bit. So it's helpful here if right away you can recognize that based on the loading situation that both AC and BC are two force members which means that 
the force that they carry has to be parallel to their length. Uh, two force members being members that just have uh, forces at the support points at either end and no force, no other force along their length if we um, neglect the weight of the components themselves. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you don't recognize that they're two force members right away, that's fine. You can, uh, you can figure that out by drawing free body diagrams for these different components taken apart from one another. So if we were to draw a free body diagram for uh, bar AC, what would we have here? So let's do that. Okay, that's not the uh, not the straightest line I've ever drawn in my life. Well, that's a tiny bit better at least. There's point A. There's point C. Okay, so let's change this into a free body diagram. Um, so let's put in our support reactions here. So we've got a y the support reaction at point a in the uh, y direction assuming we're calling upwards y then we've got a x here and now at point c right um you make a choice here do we include w at point c or not right um and if you were drawing these two different components separately, so let's just draw the other one here for good measure. There we go. So there's point C there as well, and there's point B there. Okay. Um, I'm just going to draw in my support reactions in. Uh, this direction and if you don't know what direction the support reactions are going in that's fine you can just draw them in any direction and the math will take care of itself um, <clears throat> okay so uh, you've taken apart a pin so we need to include the support reaction that would occur at that pin for each of these so let's just say that this is going to be uh, cy upwards and cx over that way. Now here obviously one of those AX and CX is in the other direction, but again the math will take care of that for you when you do it. Um, the important thing is that these support reactions here, when you draw them on this bar down here, they need to be in the opposite direction to what you've drawn here. They need to be equal and opposite to one another so that when you put those components back together, those forces cancel off and it becomes an internal force that's not shown. Um, so we need to have CY acting that way and CX acting that way. Now, here comes back to what I was saying. With this force W, Right? Uh, do you, is it proper to include that force W here at point C or here at point C? The answer is it doesn't matter, but you need to pick one or the two, one, one or the other. You can put it on either. Okay, so let's put it um, just up there. Okay. All right, um, now what I just want to show you is that if you were now to take um, a sum of the moments about point C here for member AC, you see that all of these forces pass through point C so they don't create a moment. Uh, we've got force AX that passes through point C so it doesn't have a moment arm either. The only thing that can create a moment around point C is AY, okay? So we've got here AY multiplied by this length, which is what, three and a half meters, right? Equals zero. So therefore, 
ay has to be equal to zero, okay? So again, now you can see that um, the force that AC is carrying is parallel to its length, two force member. Force it carries is parallel to its length. And this is exactly why, because you can't have a force in the vertical direction at point A or any other direction other than the horizontal direction, because then there would be a net moment about point C and the object would shift. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, recognizing um, that now, we can put the whole thing back together and then figure out what some of these support reactions are. So we've still got too many unknowns to uh, look at this all together, but if we put this back together, then CY and CX disappear. They become an internal force that doesn't show up in our free body diagram. And then we only have BY and BX remaining, okay? So let's just utilize uh, this diagram here and change that into a free body diagram of the whole object. And I know you've done this sort of thing in statics before, and I'm sort of going about it pretty slowly. You'd, you, you'd be doing it much faster than I'm doing it right now, but I just want to make sure that you're, uh, you know, you're remembering all your statics here. A um, little bit of a review. So we'll just change this into W, and let's erase this here. Here we go, point A. So what did we say? We've got AX pointing that way, okay, and then we'll erase that there, okay, and what did I have? I had BX pointing this way and BY pointing upwards like that. Okay, so now that we've got those forces in there, right, we can very quickly see that for the whole object, if we do some of the forces in the y direction, let me just do some erasing here. So, for whole object, if we neglect weight of steel then so if we neglect the weight of the bars themselves uh, they're small so they're not going to weigh much um, and we'll see that they weigh an insignificant amount relative to the externally applied load. That's gonna be the case for most of the problems that we do, is the weight of the objects themselves are gonna be insignificant compared to the externally applied loads and therefore negligible. Um, a good indication of that in the problems that we do is when uh, you're not given a density or a specific weight for the material. So we weren't told anything about the uh, density or the specific weight of steel in this problem, so we're gonna assume that they're negligible. If you are unsure about whether you can neglect the weight of the uh, material itself, then include it. That's the safe thing to do. And then you can see at the end whether it was, whether it was negligible. Okay, so for the whole object itself, if we neglect the weight of the steel, then some of the forces in the y direction has to be equal to zero and we get what? B, Y has to be equal to W there. They're the only two vertical forces. And if we do some of the forces in the X direction equals uh, zero, what do we have? We have B, X plus A, X equals zero. So A, X equals minus. Ex. OK, 
Okay, so one of those two is in the wrong direction and they're equal in magnitude to one another. All right, a uh, way to find the values for those two out, or not the values, but uh, the value in terms of our load W is to do some of the moments about some point here. Um, so what we can do here is do uh, some of the moments about um, point B in this case, and that will give us AX here. So if we did uh, some of the moments about point B equals zero, take the counterclockwise, counterclockwise direction as positive. Doesn't matter what you want to pick in terms of uh, conventions here, whether you want to take counterclockwise to be positive. Um, or clockwise to be positive when you're doing equations of statics, completely up to you. Um, here, I've got W creating a negative moment about point B, its moment arm is three and a half meters. So we have minus W times 3.5. And then AX is going to be also creating a moment in the direction of W, so a clockwise moment about point B. So minus AX multiplied by this distance here, right? Um, and that distance is going to be what? The tangent of 30 Um, multiplied by 3.5. Had a moment there. Tan 30 multiplied by 3.5. And that equals zero. I don't know what time it is for you. For me, it is 1.03 a.m. Okay, so that's my excuse for having to take a second to think about that. Um, okay, so we've got AX now written in terms of W. And you can see as we take W over to the other side and then divide through by a negative, we're going to be left with a negative here, which is an indication that AX should have been in the other direction. But we'll, we'll fix that up when we get an actual value here. Okay. Uh, 1.73 W, 1 point, and that comes out to be a negative, minus 1.73 W is our value there. Okay, so now we've got that. Whenever you come out with um, a force that's a negative here, what you want to do is change that to a positive value and go over and correct your diagram. That's important to do. Uh, because when we start doing combined loading and the stress is caused by multiple different uh, internal forces that act as a, at a point, it's really important to have those forces drawn in the correct direction so that you uh, visually get the stresses um, in the right direction and know whether to uh, add or subtract. Um, so whenever you get a negative, just uh, correct the direction of your vector here and change that to a positive number, okay? All right, um, and now we've got the differing directions between AX and BX, so we're all good there. Okay, um, so now it's time to look at what the internal forces are within these uh, two bars here, okay? Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the internal force within AC first, right, do a section cut there, then what do we have? Okay, here's point A and we've got a x equals 1.73 w there. We've sectioned through something solved, so we know we can have an internal force that's perpendicular to the cross section. That's our normal force. Uh, shear force 
V and internal moment here. And we're not going to worry again about the internal moments for uh, now, but we can still take a look at its value here. Um, <clears throat> now, it doesn't matter where I draw this section cut along the length. Any, any location between A and C, so if I drew that section cut there, the picture of the free body diagram would look exactly the same regardless of whether I take that section cut or that section cut, right? And so that's an indication that the internal forces are constant over length between A and C. Why are they constant over length? Because there's no externally applied load um, along its length. And we're considering the weight of the material itself to be negligible in this case. All right, um, so in that case, we'd want to label these internal forces here. This could be the internal normal force anywhere between A and C, so the internal normal force AC uh, and VA, let's try that again, VAC as well, okay. Um, now, uh, some of the forces in the y direction says that uh, VAC has to be equal to zero. Some of the moments about point A here says that this internal moment has to be equal to zero. Uh, we weren't going to worry about it anyway. But the only internal force we have is the internal normal force. That makes sense because we already said that both of these being two force members, the force, the net force has to be parallel to the length. Okay, so uh, here we've got what? Uh, some of the, oh, I won't cram that at the bottom, some of the forces in the x direction equal zero, so therefore NAC has to be equal to a x has to be equal to 1.73 w. Okay, so now we're on our way, right? Now we've got the internal normal force. In terms of w, we've got the maximum normal stress, so we could go about calculating what the maximum value of w was given this maximum normal stress. Now, before we do that, both AC and BC have the same cross-sectional area. So whichever of these two bars has the higher internal normal force, that will be the bar that limits the value of W. So before we go and calculate the stress, we might as well figure out what the internal normal force is in BC. And if it's higher than 1.73 W, then we'll use that internal normal force to calculate what the maximum value of W is based on the strength of our material. Okay, so let's clear some space up here. Do, 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 do. Okay, there we go, that's enough. Okay, so uh, to figure out what the internal force is in here, we do a section cut through it like that. Okay, and we've got BX. Right, uh, Bx is equal to Ax, so Bx is 1.73 W as well. By, we said, is equal to W. And we know that if we take the vector summation of those two, then that force vector has to be pointing parallel to the length of that member because as we've talked about, it's a two force member, it has to carry force parallel to its length. So 
this will just have an internal normal force and we'll call that NBC since that is the internal normal force anywhere between BC and the shear force VBC is zero as is the internal moment there. All right, so we've only got NBC here. So uh, NBC is just going to be um, the vector sum of those. So we've got NBC is uh, the square root of what one or W squared for uh, BY plus 1.73 W squared to the power of one half for the square root. Okay, and that gives us, yes it does, 2w, okay? So indeed, the internal normal force in BC is greater than the internal normal force in AC. Therefore, stress in BC greater than AC. and will be the limiting factor for our max value of W. So let's go ahead and calculate what that maximum value of W is then. Okay, so we're gonna use our equation for normal stress and we're gonna say that the normal stress in BC is going to be equal to the normal force in BC divided by the cross-sectional area of BC. Okay, what do we substitute in for the stress? We're substituting in for the maximum stress that we're going to allow the steel to go up to. So that's 280 megapascals. So we've got 280 times 10 to the 6 to put that into pascals. Remember, when you're working in SI, you want everything in pascals, newtons, meters. Um, newtons here. And uh, so NBC, we've got 2W, right? So if we just leave this as W, then that is in uh, Newtons there. Uh, and divide by the cross-sectional area, we want meters here. So 0 0.025 for the height and 0 0.01 for the width here. So that again gives us W in Newtons. Thirty-five thousand it comes out to be. So that's thirty-five kilonewtons is the max value of W W max. Okay. All right, so quite a, you know, quite a long process to get there with explaining everything. But um, of course, now that you've, you've had your statics refresher, you could do this very quickly. Um, <clears throat> okay, part two of the problem. What did part two say? Let's, let's, let's clean some space here before we do part two. Now, before we erase everything. Let's just make a note that this was W, this was 1.73 W, and this is 1.73 W as well. Okay, um, and this here, the vector sum of this, we'll just call force B, and that was uh, 2 W. Of course, you only show either the, the vector sum or the two components, uh, one or the other. So let's do that and only show the resultant force at point B here. 
so that we don't get confused. So FB is 2W, the force of B. Okay, put that up there. <clears throat> Back to the problem statement. Here, what have we got? Part two, for this weight, which was our 35 kilonewtons, so part two, um, four W max from uh, part one. What are the required pin diameters A and B rounded to the nearest millimeter? Okay, uh, for W max from part one, uh, required diameters for pins A and B to the near nearest millimeter. Okay. <clears throat> if we want to um, figure out what the size of those pins need to be, we need to uh, look at what the internal forces are like within them and then we'll figure out what type of stress we're going to have and uh, then use our stress values to uh, size the pins. So let's let's do pin A first. Pin A. Okay, free body diagram of pin A. We'll take the overhead view uh, of it like this. Okay, so there it is. Uh, what forces is it seeing? Well, uh, Force AX is the support reaction that the pin is exerting on uh, member AC at point A. So if that's the force on the bar, then the pin has an equal and opposite force on it. So here is AX, and that is equal to 1.73 multiplied by... W, which we now know is 35 kilonewtons, 33 times 35 times 10 to the 3 newtons. Okay. Um, and what is holding the pin, right? We've got um, a force in the other direction from the bracket. So this is um, <clears throat> also equal to AX in that direction. We'll just call it here the force from uh, the wall W. All right, so in terms of, um, in terms of stress here, right, the, we've got, one force pulling this way and another force pulling the other direction below it. So that's a shearing action, right? It's causing the material to want to slide uh, at the interface between those two forces, right? So right along that line there, there is going to be an internal shear force, which means there's going to be internal shear stress. Okay, so let's draw what our free body diagram looks like here. So we've got AX and then we've got the internal shear within uh, pin A is going to be equal to AX here. Okay. All right. Now, um, here, there's going to be no internal normal force in the pin. That's zero, assuming that the, again, the weight of the pin is negligible. It's going to be a small 
a uh, little piece of steel, so it's going to have negligible weight in relation to the loads that are applied to it. And then we'd have um, a small moment like this, recognizing that the distance between uh, the interface and that force L here, that distance is going to be uh, quite small, so that moment's going to be small as well. Okay, um, this is why that moment there is why it's important to have the uh, member that's being loaded and the bracket very close together so they're not separated out by uh, some sort of big gap like that where then you would get a significant internal bending moment within that pin. All right, um, so recognizing now that there's only shear, internal shear force present in the pin um, and no internal normal force, then we can use the maximum shear stress to calculate what the required diameter of that pin needs to be. So we can say that the shear stress in pin A is going to be equal to the internal shear force in pin A divided by the cross-sectional area of pin A. Okay, internal shear stress, or the shear stress, we're going to set to the maximum shear stress, so 145 times 10 to the 6 to put our megapascals into pascals here. The internal shear force in pin A we said was 1.73 times the maximum value of W, 35 kilonewtons. So 1.73 times 35 times 10 to the 3. Again, putting that into newtons. So we've got P, we've got pascals, newtons, meters. And then pi over 4, the diameter of pin A squared. Pi over 4 D squared, same as pi uh, R squared. Okay, so out of that we get the diameter of pin A and it's going to come out in meters and we convert that into millimeters. Twenty three point one millimeters is the number that I got when I did this. Again, it comes out in meters. Uh, multiply it by a thousand to get millimeters. Now we're told here that we want this to the nearest millimeter. Uh, twenty three is a lot closer than twenty four, but if you round down to twenty three you're taking material away, you're making the pin smaller, right? You've got the same internal force here, smaller area that you're spreading that over, so the stress is going to increase. So if you round this down to 23, then the actual stress is going to be above your maximum stress, and we were told we had to be below, uh, or we were told this was the maximum stress, so we can't go higher than this. So we have no choice but to round this up to 24 millimeters. You always have to round in the direction that makes something safer. Okay. Uh, sometimes that's rounding up, sometimes it's rounding down. It depends on the situation. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay. So that's, uh, that's pin A there. Let's go ahead and do uh, pin B now. I think we're done with this here. Uh, remembering that the force on pin B is 2W.
So let's go ahead and do uh, pin B about here. Pin B. Okay. There we go. Okay, so pin B sees a force from member BC acting right on its center. So like that, if we're looking at the top view, and this is a force of 2W here, which is 2 times 35 kilonewtons, right? Holding that pin in place and stopping it from accelerating to the right is the force that the bracket's applying. So we've got a force like this, one there and one there. Now, if everything's symmetric here, which uh, brackets are designed uh, to be, then each one of these has to be half of that. So we've got W there and W there, right? Which means that uh, when we section this, the shear that this pin is seeing is again between these points of load application. So we've got one shear location there. We've got another shear location there. Either one that you choose, the internal shear in pin B comes out to be W and you'd get the exact same thing, right? If you chose that one there, we've got W. So the internal shear B of pin B is also W there. So <clears throat> this is called a double shear configuration again, because the load that's being applied to the pin, it is split between these two cross sectional surfaces each of which sees half of that magnitude as the internal shear. So 2W gets split and we've got an internal shear of W there and an internal shear of W up there. Okay, so let's do the, uh, let's do the calculation then. So we're gonna say that the shear stress in pin B is going to be equal to the internal shear force in pin B divided by the cross-sectional area of pin B. Shear stress, we're gonna let it go up to the maximum stress of 145 megapascals times 10 to the six pascals. Our internal shear force is just W, which we said was 35 kilonewtons divided by the cross-sectional area, pi over four diameter of pin B squared. Okay, that, let's run the numbers on that and see what it gives us. Diameter of pin B comes out to be, Seventeen point five millimeters. Okay, and again we have to round up for safety in this case. Eighteen millimeters. Okay, great. So that's that problem uh, taken care of. So hopefully that gave you a good review of um, you know taking apart assemblies and um, doing section cuts and that sort of thing. So the next problem is gonna be, next two problems are nice and short. Short, quick problems, but they um, <clears throat> illustrate important concepts, which is a great thing for a tutorial to do. Amazing. Okay. So let's see if we can draw this here. 
So we've got a thin plate here like this, and let's make it a bit three-dimensional. Right, good. And we've got um, a small circular or a cylindrical punch here that is going down and is punching circles out of this uh, plate here. So let's see a bit of a back edge of that like there. Okay, and then the piece of metal that it's punched out right there something like that and then uh, this plates moving along a production line right so this punch is stationary and as this moves along it goes to the next larger punch okay that then punches out the same um, punches out a portion that's centered on that hole as it moves along. So we get a larger uh, one taken out there. And then the piece. Wow, that was a that was a terrible attempt at drawing an oval. There we go. We've already got the hole in from the first one there. And we get the second one right like there. So we're making washers in this production line. We punch out the center of the washer and then we punch out the outside like this out of a thin plate. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's put some dimensions on here. This is the thickness of the plate is one eighth of an inch. The diameter of this large punch is a half an inch the diameter of the diameter of the small punch is a half an inch the diameter of the large punch is one inch and the question statement says uh, washers are being punched out of a 1 8 inch thick aluminum plate the maximum normal stress that the aluminum can withstand before breaking is 68 KSI. So let's just write this here, 68 KSI, 68,000 PSI that is, kilopounds per square inch. Um, and the maximum shear stress that it can withstand is 34, so tau max is 34 KSI. Determine the minimum force that needs to be applied to punch A and punch B in order to punch the material out of that plate. Okay, minimum force that needs to be applied to punch A and punch B. So we've got the minimum force needed at punch A and punch B. So punch A, punch B, what's the minimum force that uh, those punches have to apply to the plate to punch these um, shapes out, and these cylinders out. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, let's deal with um, punch A first. All right, so what we wanna do here, so this, this, this plug of material is being punched out of that plate. We wanna figure out basically what force do we need to apply to the top of it to punch it out of the plate. So the thing to do is analyze the free body diagram of this plug of material when it's back in the plate, okay? So when piece removed by punch A is back 
in the plate, then let's draw the force balance on it. Okay, so we'll draw this a little bit bigger here, a little bit larger. There we go. So this is this is in the plate now. Um, what to take this out of the plate? What um, what surface did we take our section cut along, right? Or what surface would we need to take our section cut along? Well, this would be a section cut line all the way around, and this would be a cut edge there, and then this would be a cut edge there. And the surface that we've sectioned to bring this out of the plate is this cylindrical surface area all the way around. Okay, um, so force balance for this piece of material when it's back in the plate, we've got the force from punch A acting downwards in the y direction. Um, if this is in static equi equilibrium, then we need to have an equal and opposite force in the uh, y direction. Where is this? Well, it, there's no other externally applied loads to this piece, so it's an internal force, or it's coming from internal forces, and those need to be along the section surface that we cut. So these are small forces that are occurring all over that surface that we've sectioned to bring this out. Now those forces are parallel to the section cut, so they are shear forces. Okay, um, <clears throat> so those shear forces need to balance uh, Fa. Okay. So now we can start to see what we'd do. So these, these shear forces are the summation of these small shear forces has to be uh, equal to Fa. Um, so now we can see what we need to do. We've got the internal or the maximum shear stress that the material can withstand and we can relate that to the shear force that's going to be experienced on that surface, right, which is going to be equal to Fa. So we'll say that tau is V divided by A, the maximum shear stress 34 times 10 to the 3 PSI is going to be equal to uh, V, which is Fa here. And then uh, we want the cross-sectional area that that shear force is acting over. Now again, that, sh that surface is a cylindrical surface all around uh, the outside of that plug of material. So if we were to sort of unroll that, right, we would have a rectangular uh, surface that is thickness T here, that's thickness T there, where T is our one eighth of an inch, and then the length here would be the circumference of that cylinder of material, which is uh, pi d, okay? So our cross-sectional area here is pi d t, and that's the area that our shear force is acting over. So Fa divided by pi, diameter is a half inch, a half inch, and our thickness is one eighth of an inch and that tells us what the required force fa needs to be to punch that plug of material out six point seven k i p so it comes out to be 
6,700 pounds, and then I'm dividing by 1,000 to convert it into kilopounds here. Kips. <clears throat> okay, we can do the um, exact same thing for the second punch. Okay. When we do the uh, look at the second punch here, right? We've got a piece of material that looks like this. Now that internal surface. Well, it's just a smooth line there, since that's not a section cut that we're looking to take that out of the plate once it's in there. Um, and again, we've got the force from punch B being applied there. And then all around this cylindrical surface on the outside, we've got the shear force V. So same deal here, um, same equation. So we've got tau is V over A, 34 times 10 to the three equals the force from punch B, in this case, divided by the area, which is equal to what we've got uh, pi DT again, uh, but for this, larger cylindrical area. Okay, so pi diameter was one inch, one inch and one eighth of an inch there. So it looks exactly the same, uh, but we've just got, instead of a half, we've got one inch there. Right, so this FB is going to be what, 12, 13.4. Uh, now, if I keep more decimal places, does it, yeah, comes out to be 13.4. Kip. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so just, just a very simple problem just to um, illustrate First of all, the uh, concept that sometimes if you've got a situation where a piece of material is being removed from something and you want to figure out the, the force required to do that or some variation of a problem like that, sometimes you need to consider what the force balance would have been when the piece of material was back connected to the rest of the object. And then um, the other portion of this problem, just understanding that you're looking for um, a cylindrical surface area here that the shear force, the internal shear force is spread over. Okay, one more problem to do for this tutorial, and then you should be uh, very well set up to do the questions on the first problem set. Okay, <clears throat> so question, let's see, okay. So this one has a, a stress strain graph here. Now, let me, let me actually pause for a second because it would be kind of nice to just um, bring this up on the, uh, on the screen instead of me drawing it since it's a graph. Let's see.
Okay, so this is better than me trying to draw this graph is to just have it on the screen. And now uh, I've got my glasses on so I can see what I'm looking at here. Okay, so let me, uh, here's the picture that goes with the problem. Let me read the problem statement now. So the stress strain, so we've got stress here and strain along the x-axis. The stress strain curve for an aluminum alloy uh, XYZ is shown below, or right here on the glass in this case. What is the maximum change in length that a 12 meter rod, there we go, made of the same aluminum alloy XYZ can undergo and still return to its original length when unloaded? Okay, so we want to know max length, GD length change for rod for, this should be uh, for a 12 meter rod. Material X, Y, Z, and still return to original length when unloaded. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we've got our rod here, all right? Our 12 meter long rod. What is the largest length change that this 12 meter rod can undergo that's, that's the, the 12 meter rod is made of this material and still return to its original length when unloaded? Okay, so we've talked about stress strain diagrams in lecture two now, and you know that um, for most of our conventional engineering uh, metals, we've got a stress strain diagram that initially looks a bit like this, where we've got a linear region here. And then at some point, the curve starts becoming uh, non-linear, okay? And the point at which the um, stress strain curve goes from being linear to non-linear is called the yield point and that is the point uh, after which you pass that an object will become permanently deformed and won't return to its original length. Uh, so we can pick off the yield point um, here. Let's uh, it looks to me like based on that uh, best fit dotted line that it sort of starts to deviate from the curve around this 225 megapascal uh, point, sort of right there, okay? So this is going to be our yield point uh, sigma y right there, okay? So uh, thinking about length, right? Um, we know that strain is equal to change in length divided by an object's original length. Uh, so if we just picked off the yield strength or the yield, the yield strain that corresponded to this yield point down here, we could pop that in for epsilon uh, we've got L naught, which is 12 meters, and that would enable us to calculate uh, delta L. Easy, right? No problem. A um, little hard to estimate where that is down on the x-axis. Uh, they're easier to look at the value of stress and then use that 225 megapascals uh, combined with the equation for that linear best fit line to calculate what the corresponding yield strain would be. So let's let's do that. So we know that the 
relationship between stress and strain here is given by the modulus of elasticity. So we have stress equals, uh, what is that? 67,700, is that 67,700? Yeah, I my, my eyes were playing tricks on me. 67,797 multiplied by our value of strain. And this is in units of MPA there. Does that make sense? This is the modulus of elasticity. Divide that by 10 to the 3, we get gigapascals. Yeah, 68 gigapascals is about the modulus of elasticity of aluminum. So that makes, uh, that makes sense here. Okay. <clears throat> so let's put our uh, 200 and 25 megapascals in for our stress, which is our yield stress. And then this is six, seven, nine, seven, multiplied by epsilon. This gives us out our value of strain there. What did I get when I did it? Um, okay, I took a shortcut and uh, went uh, through um, I, I did a substitution here. So I substituted delta L over L naught in for epsilon and then calculated delta L directly. Um, let me just grab my calculator since we started doing it this way anyway. Might as well follow through with that. So 225 divided by 67,797 gives us uh, 0 0.003319. Uh, remember strain, um, it's good to include your units here. So uh, meters per meter in this case. And then if you include those units, you don't get mixed up about whether you're talking uh, about strain in percent. Okay, um, now what we can do is we can use this equation here and say that our strain 0 0.003319 is the change in length, the maximum change in length that this uh, rod, there it is, can undergo before permanently deforming divided by its original length, which was 12 meters. So let's see, change in length. That's coming out of here in uh, meters, multiply by a thousand to get it into millimeters, and it comes out to be 39 millimeters. Okay, great. So that's the uh, that's the final problem that I wanted to take you through there. Um, just sort of a reminder about how um, how what yield strength is and uh, basic calculation involving that. All right. Okay. We'll see you again for uh, tutorial two.